Great. Yeah, and thanks for inviting us. Um, and we wanted to start this presentation um, with a land acknowledgement. Uh, Matt and I are presenting in different, different traditional lands of First Nations, but what we really wanted to acknowledge here is that the traditional lands of a number of different First Nations were affected by the November flood. And really what we saw was some of the social application, applications of this flood um, were legacies of the Indian Act. And we're gonna get into that discussion later, but we wanted to start that. It's an uncomfortable thing to start with, but as geoscientists and engineers, it's something we have to wrestle with uh, as part of geohazard assessments. It's not just the science, but it also has to do with the social structures in which we operate. Um, yeah, so I'll give it over to Matt to kind of describe what we're gonna talk about today. Yeah, so first of all, thanks, Jack, for, for having us and um, yeah, excited to, to be here today and to share some of our stories with you from, from last November. And uh, we'll, we'll talk, Carrie Ann and I will, will split the presentation a, a little bit. Uh, Carrie Ann will talk about the atmospheric river events that occurred in November of last year and why, why they had the impact that they did and uh, sort of the, the different elements that really came together to make that um, that November and early December is as catastrophic as it was. We'll then talk a little bit about some of the damage that occurred and, and the implications of it across uh, different sectors and different people that um, were directly and indirectly impacted by it. And then a, a little bit on, on the response from, from BGC side, and this will really be sort of our stories of the clients that we helped in the immediate uh, aftermath of the event. And, it was now sort of uh, four four plus months ago, um, and and the work that we'll present today is, is really focused on on what was done in November and December of, of 2021, and some of the different techniques that that were utilized, and and how um, we're able to come together with different disciplines and sectors uh, to to really respond in a in as efficient way as we thought was possible. So I'll hand it back to Carrie Ann to walk through with some really neat graphics what this uh, atmospheric river was and why it caused the destruction that it did. Okay, so many people probably heard the term atmospheric river the first time last November. Um, and really what it is, is an atmospheric condition that transports a narrow band of moisture from the tropics into Western North America. And you can think of them as rivers in the sky. And so they have different uh, intensities and volumes and transport rates, just like rivers do. And normally most of our rain and snow in Western US and Canada comes from these atmospheric rivers. They predominantly occur within that kind of winter North American season. And so in a, in, a, in a whole, they're largely beneficial. They restore our reservoirs, they uh, contribute snow that we love to ski in, but every once in a while, we get really significant and intense atmospheric rivers that can cause flooding. And so these are on a whole largely damaging. And there's a recently released scale that uh, looks at both the intensity of the water vapor, as well as the duration of the event, and it can be used similar to what you would describe as a hurricane. So it's a scale of one to five. And looking at these atmospheric rivers, you can kind of rate ones and twos largely beneficial, three somewhere in the middle, and fours and fives being largely catastrophic. And so we'll talk about that. But just to kind of picture in your head, kind of similar to hurricanes, we have a rating scale for them. Um, but it's not just an atmospheric river that we saw last year. This is a series of atmospheric events that occurred right and it was the result of a year of us beginning to see the effects of climate change in a significant way in BC. So we began last June with a significant heat dome, which saw historic temperatures, uh, records smashed all over the province. Um, my home was 37, 38 degrees at one point, extremely uncomfortable. And then it went straight into a very wild, uh, significant wildfire season. We had the third largest wildfire season on record, and then on top of that, we then go into a wetter than normal fall with La Nina conditions. And then we had November and December atmospheric river events. And not just one, by the time the November atmospheric river event occurred, we had chalked up at least five to six. And in November and December alone, we saw five different events. 
And so we think about this not just as this one event, but all of the legacies of these different events occurring in one year. And this is just a graphic here that shows, or a video that shows that accumulation of all that moisture at the same time, kind of progressing from November 10th through the 15th. And the colors that you see on the screen is all of the water that's being dumped and, and pointed straight at the lower mainland into southwestern BC and into northwestern Washington. And so we have this plume of about 2,500 kilometers long of moisture that's coming in and pushing into British Columbia. And what that resulted in is over a course of about two days, we saw in some locations more than 300 millimeters of rain dump. And in some parts of BC, that's actually quite normal. If you were to take you know, a couple hundred millimeters on the North Shore, uh, that would be a fairly normal wet fall for us. Um, you know, maybe a rainfall warning. But what we saw with this event was really it was the alignment of that stream of moisture into the Fraser Valley here, which is sort of oriented in this direction between Vancouver and towards Hope, kind of following Highway 1 that's on this image here. And because it was directly aimed at that valley, the rainfall began to condense and then push all of that moisture straight into the top of the Fraser Valley, which is near Hope and then push up and over our rain shadow into the interior of British Columbia, which in some locations is almost a dry desert-like area. And so it's this kind of nuance of an event that you know, wasn't that intense it, on that kind of rating scale of a one to five, how bad was this atmospheric river? We would only rate this as a three. But when you take that kind of topographic amplification, and throw it on top of all of our infrastructure and this wetter than normal fall, we saw resultant rainfall that was anywhere from a 50 to a thousand year return period because of that amplification in there. And what we now understand with a recently released attribution study is that these types of events have become more frequent and greater intensity due to climate change. And there's the in press right now is, is that attribution study that talks about that and how we're going to see these increased atmospheric river events in the future. And what scares me is knowing that this was a three, but we can go all the way up to a five. So not only are we going to be seeing more of these events, but they could become larger and they could last a longer time period. And so it's something to consider in the future. So I'm gonna talk about a few examples of the damage that occurred during this event. And for those that aren't local to the lower mainland, I just wanna make sure this isn't hiding. There we go, that. Um, I'll just provide some, some geographic context as to where these occur. So on the left image, what you have here is the extents of flooding. And so both small streams and large streams had significant flooding. And on the right, what you see is landslides. So anything from kind of a debris flood scenario all the way up to uh, large bank erosion landslide contributions. And I've also overlaid the 2021 wildfire perimeters. And you can see we also had a number of events that occurred within these fire areas. And so we'll focus in this presentation on a few different case study sites. So we have uh, in the Thompson River Valley, we've got the Nickerman River. And in the Coldwater River, which flows from the top of the Coquihalla down towards Merritt, we'll look at a couple, both the Coldwater River and a tributary called Gillette Creek. We'll go down the hill on Highway 5 to Coquihalla and look at Coquihalla River. And then we'll talk about a few examples of some debris flows in the Fraser Valley and near Pemberton. So we'll start with some of the most damaging events and that really, for those that uh, aren't familiar with the lower mainland, essentially there's only a few transportation corridors to escape out of here from. Um, and Highway 5 or the Coquihalla is our main shipping corridor. It's a four lane highway, uh, great grades, transports most of our, our shipments through there. And you can see that there were a number of bridge failures that occurred in this area, and it was primarily from bank erosion. And so these rivers moved in some cases 50 to 100 meters laterally and eroded some of the approaches to these bridges. 
And not only was it just precipitation that occurred, but it was this amplification of a large intense system. And because it's a tropical moisture system, it also causes a lot of snow melt. And you can kind of see in this image, there's a little bit of snow, but what you should notice is that these uh, mountains in the background were just a week prior covered in snow. And then during this event, that all melted off and contributed to the flood. So this is a, a graphic here showing the, the distribution of the major flooding events that occurred. And I'll kind of point out here, you'll see this, these few basins in through here, the cold water, the Coquihalla, and then the Sunil Kameen and Tulamine rivers. And these all experienced a record, if not two to three times flood of record. And so it's really the resultant, all of that snow melt, all of that high intensity rain occurring in just a couple of days that caused this flood. But it wasn't just this area. We also saw floods um, not as, in, as large, but in other areas of the province over onto Vancouver Island and even through the Fraser Valley. And notably, uh, the Nooksack River here, as well as the Sumas River, which is in Abbotsford here, uh, flooding into the Fraser Valley that Matt will provide an example of later. And uh, I'll kind of shift over further north into uh, the Nickaman River. And just highlighting here that because we've had this interaction of rainfall and snowmelt and post wildfire effects, um, this is one of the tributaries of the Nickaman River that burned this summer during this uh, extreme fire near Lytton. And you can see the number of debris flows that have occurred in this watershed. Uh, this was entirely treed prior to the event. And you can see all of this uh, very bright looking soil that's all post wildfire debris flows. And all of that sediment went into the major Nickaman River. And so during this event, when we had a high flood discharge, it went downstream and took out massive amounts of banks in this area. So this is uh, the Nickaman River Road Bridge, which is the access road for the Nickaman uh, Indian Band. And that bridge, uh, you can see the bank erosion in the back here, but that was about 10 years of erosion that occurred. And just downstream of here, we have Highway 1 and then we have CP Rail. And all three of these bridges experienced a significant amount of erosion. And so really it's this amplification of, of post wildfire and intense rainfall and snow melt all occurring at one site. And it was quite, quite humbling to see this because I had literally just issued the report for this site that day. And nearly all of the uh, things that we described came true that day. So if we shift now towards the south, we've got the Coquihalla River near Hope, and this is a, a photo looking at almost peak flood. And you can see that the bank erosion that occurred here across many rivers really was uh, encroaching upon many houses. And in this case, um, some of the RV uh, sites that are here in a campground in a place called Fish Camp. And so uh, we saw not only um, bridges and infrastructure, but also houses being threatened by all the flooding that occurred. Now, so we talked about long duration rainfall leading to flooding, but because this was an atmospheric river event, we also had high hourly rainfall intensities. Um, in some cases, 10, 15 millimeters an hour over a sustained period. So four to six hours in some places. And for those of us that work with debris flows, we know that that tends to be the time when debris flows occur. And this is an example here. It's showing two different views, one from the ground and one from the air of the same site. And you can see for scale there, that little blue thing, that's porta potty and that's a semi-trailer. And we had all of these debris flows occurring um, on our major highway networks. And slowly, one by one, all of our road networks became blocked. And we were not able to access most of these sites to look at them. And so most of us had to use helicopters to fly around and, and um, make some of our assessments. And just a couple other examples here of different varieties of debris flows that we saw. So this is an example near Pemberton on the Duffy Lake Road or Highway 99. And you can see that this debris flow is actually sourced from a logging road uh, and uh, that was built about 30 or 40 years ago. And so in a number of locations, we also saw uh, these debris flows triggered from fill fares within those road prisms. And uh, this, unfortunately, I don't think it's this exact debris flow that occurred here, but in one of those cases, uh, this is what caused most of the fatalities um, from this event um, by 
some people who were traveling down the road, um, again, not this debris flow, but stopped because a little bit of debris was on the highway, and then a secondary landslide occurred um, that pushed their cars uh, over an embankment. Um, so really tragically, it's kind of a, a, a kind, of, kind of a legacy or a societal issue is that we not only have to grapple with these science things, but we also have to grapple with some of our decisions um, with policies. And then um, as Matt will point out, this um, in our mountainous corridors, not only do we have highways, but we also have another of other infrastructure. So in this case, on this image, what you're gonna see, this is um, a pipeline right of way here with an aerial crossing, and then a secondary pipeline on this side, and then our four lanes of uh, highway traffic here. And all of those, all of this side of the river is affected uh, by, by the blockage from that debris flow. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Matt to talk about some of the implications of everything that we observed in the events. Yeah, I wonder, there's a couple of questions that pertain to the stuff you just talked about. Uh, Jack or Will or Suzanne, should, should Carrie Ann answer some questions now or should we take them all at the end? Um, I, I think we can um, circle back at the end. I'll, I'll okay. keep track of them, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks Carrie Ann, that was awesome. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll chat a little bit now about some of the some of the implications of it, and and I think Carrie Ann has control, so she can go to the next next slide, and um, we'll see if this video plays. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but this was, so, yeah, this is a drone video that was taken uh, in the immediate aftermath the, the next morning um, of one of the big landslide events uh, that came down, took out the highway and um, pushed some cars over the highway and in, into the water below. There were no fatalities at, at this site, um, but there was a lot of damage. And this is one of the events that, that pinned people in um, that had to be rescued out by, uh, by helicopters. Uh, so you can see some of the excavators at the bottom uh, on the highway just for scale. These are huge, huge events um, that just caused uh, really incredible amounts of, of destruction. So this UAV was flown by by BGC or Alex Baumgard, who some of you may know, who is part of the Canada. He's part of the Canada Urban Search and Rescue Task Force, and was deployed um, immediately to assist with some of these some of these events. So I'm go to the next one, Carrie. So the, the three three big things that we'll talk about of getting impacted were were people, um, transportation, and, and energy. And this event caused literally thousands of people to be displaced from their homes. Um, there were fatalities. The, the photo on the left shows the, the Duffy Lake uh, Road mudslide that, that had um, a handful of fatalities. Um, and just the, the destruction was huge. There are some people that are still displaced from their homes in some of the First Nations communities um, and some of the other communities that just had just incredible impacts. And so you can see the flooding here. There's there's highways, there's uh, homes that are underwater. Um, and so just the, the scale of the event and the, the spatial extent of it was just um, something we hadn't seen before in this part of the world. So we're gonna go to the next one. So transportation um, in and out of Vancouver is, is generally reliant on a few main corridors, the Trans-Canada, Highway 5, Highway 8, um, and then, or going north up through Whistler and then um, through Squamish and out that way. Uh, and all of these main roads were impacted by this event and they were all closed. And so the, the only ways out of Vancouver by road um, involved taking a ferry up north and then going across um, or about a, a 10, 10 to 12 hour detour through the United States. Um, and, and some of these roads were closed for, for weeks. Some still are closed um, or have temporary access. Like the Trans-Canada has a, a single lane bridge over Jackass Mountain that uh, still is not fixed. Uh, lots of sections of the Coquihalla that are still not fixed and, and won't be fixed for, for quite some time, but there are, um, it is open for, um, for traffic. Uh, but the, the impact on human vehicles that are humans humans moving around was was pretty staggering um considering that uh, if you were in vancouver and you wanted to leave you really couldn't for quite some time um so it was a really uh an in interesting event when you think of the multiple corridors all hit by the same event and all closed for uh, significant amounts of time 
And even if you wanted to leave, um, you couldn't, uh, there, there were mandates on how much fuel you could put in your car. So one of the, this, or some of the slides that we'll show later are the pipelines that were impacted by this. So the main pipelines coming down the, the Coquihalla corridor were shut in, which led to gas rationing in the lower mainland. Um, and it was, it was lifted on in sort of mid-December, uh, but fuel, fuel is limited in cars up to about 30 liters. Um, wasn't strictly enforced, but it was um, uh, sort of buyer supported that it, uh, fuel was rationed. So just to have major sectors, major, major critical infrastructure impacted all by the same event uh, caused significant financial implications on, uh, on, on the community. And uh, it, it might be, I think the estimates are that it'll probably be Canada's most um, expensive natural disaster. Uh, but obviously the, the numbers aren't, aren't final um, and we probably won't know that for a long time. But just really, really big, big impacts. So when we talk about the response, uh, again, like you guys just have me and Carrie Ann here today for better or for worse. And so we'll talk about the work that we did, we were two very small pieces of this uh, of this response, and and we'll talk about the work that we did with our with our clients that span the pipeline sector, the community sector, uh, and the highway sector. And um, just know that there's lots lots of other work that that happened in a pretty big team. And so, yeah, we these are the the main sectors that we supported in the aftermath and continue to work with today in response to this event. And um, yeah, you just have me and Carrie Ann here, and, and I'm a, we're, we're both sort of geohazards type people, um, but there is huge involvement from the surface water, um, hydrotechnical um, based folks, civil geotechnical engineers, GIS, computer science, software developers, remote sensing people, data scientists, climate scientists, and then project management, because as you can imagine, um, there was a lot going on in a very short amount of time with people going into the field, people working from the office and trying to find ways to support lots of different asset owners with um, only a finite number of, of engineers and geoscientists and, and scientists do the work. So there's a lot of internal communication and client communication to, to move everything as, as quickly as possible. So when we talk about a, a coordinated approach from BGC's perspective, um, we kind of had two, two big groups of people, uh, well, one, one bigger than the other, but two, two kind of groups of people, those that were off in the field, uh, which was mainly comprised of engineers and geoscientists. Um, Carrie Ann was in the field the next day uh, out in a helicopter and our field engineers and geoscientists were equipped with their, with their field bags of iPads and cameras and, and UAVs and, access to software that the BGC has that um, sort of had old inspections, LIDAR data, prepped for field work and, and to get people out the door as quickly as possible. There was a lot of time spent in helicopters flying over the sites, um, a lot of good coordination. If you're in a helicopter for a pipeline client, but you're flying over a highway that has a bridge falling down and folks were taking photos of that and, and sharing it back um, across clients, across, across consultants as well. The, the field teams were doing a lot of detailed site inspections, so aerial inspections and then getting on the ground at, at particular sites and, and taking close up photos, looking at um, just the extent of the damage, which, which really was remarkable in some areas with 50, 100 meters of lateral bank erosion and the pipelines exposed and, and highways just completely uh, obliterated that used to be there before. And then on top of that, trying to coordinate safety. Um, so this was um, during COVID, obviously. And so coordinating people that were, were in the field, um, safety precautions, and uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of helicopters flying in the narrow corridor, uh, which just that made extra complexity. And then there was actually one bgc -er that was stuck. Uh, she was traveling with her family and was trapped behind one of the landslides. So there's just that little added complexity of trying to get a bgc -er stuck uh, out of the out of uh, hope. And then in the office, we had a lot of different teams working together on this organizing data uh, that we had, organizing data that was being collected in the field. Carrie Ann, for example, would be collecting a, a few hundred photos and then coming home at night and putting them on the on our drives for people to look at and get into inspections and, and, and 
use that data to try to start making some decisions and recommendations. There was a lot of data procurement and processing. BGC worked with um, a few clients right off the bat to organize LIDAR collections. We worked with McElhaney to collect LIDAR data um, for about 500 kilometers of the, the Highway 5 corridor. And then getting that data in and, and turning it around into products that could be used. Um, we did a lot of LIDAR change detection, looking at a lot of weather data, um, and then trying to stay coordinated with our clients. So it was a, a really big coordinated team effort and something that's really hard to plan for. But um, in the moment, you kind of figure it out as you go and, and hope for the best. Um, so it was, I think, a lot of lessons learned during this, but also a lot of um, just really great coordination with with our clients willing to work together as well and, and understand each other's priorities. So now into some of the tools that we used. So one of the things that we did right off the bat was uh, using a lot of oblique aerial photogrammetry. And so either doing this from drones um, in the latter stages or in the very early stages, just our, our field teams taking lots of pictures out the, the door of their helicopter or the window of their helicopter. And just the idea being that uh, if you've got an iPad or a, an iPhone that has a GPS in it, then all the photos that you take have a have a geolocation tag to them. It's not perfect. You have zero ground control in, in these instances. But if you take the right number of photos at approximately the right orientations, then we can use software to turn those 20, 50, 100 photos into a 3D model of a site. And so we had field teams that were collecting these photos and they, again, at the end of their day, uploading them and then Folks on the East Coast would grab them in the morning. We'd uh, work our computers pretty hard and turn these uh, sites back into 3D models and share them back. And so Karen goes to the next page. This is an example of what one of these looks like. And so this is made from about 50 photos that was flown in a helicopter, probably in about five or 10 minutes on site. And the, the engineer geoscientist would just be taking overlapping photos and then we would take these and, and turn them back into this uh, color in, in, or like image coded uh, 3D photogrammetry model and then put them up on a web-based viewer so that anyone with the link could have access to them. And so they're not perfect. Um, the scale is probably within about uh, three to five percent of true scale. Uh, so you can measure uh, rough amounts of, of volumes or distances from it. But what it really allows you to do is, is just provide a sort of full cover picture of what something looks like. And so you can see pretty clearly here that uh, well, the highway that used to run underneath this bridge uh, no longer exists. The bridge has obviously collapsed. Um, and then what we can also do with these is compare them against older LIDAR data and, and get a rough idea of the, the changes that occurred. And so we were able to do this within hours of data collection and just providing uh, a really easy to understand visual back to people um, that were having to make pretty significant decisions. Um, and this, this was an easier method to do it than with just a single photo. So as I mentioned, one of the, one of the main things that we did was, was procure airborne LIDAR data through this corridor. And so pretty soon after the event, we realized that just the amount of, of destruction was, was really big. And that in order to identify all the geohazard events and start assessing things like volumes for rebuild and, and banks that needed to be armored, um, that being able to conduct LIDAR change detection along this corridor was gonna be a hugely valuable um, task to undertake. And so we worked with, um, two pipeline operators and the city of Merritt to collect data along this corridor. And, and McElhaney had planes out in the air within a couple of days collecting this data. And we were able to collect the entire corridor before heavy snow came in. Um, and they were they prioritized the delivery of this data back to us. And so basically as they flew it, we would get it sort of 24 to 48 hours later and have the whole, we had the whole corridor delivered uh, it was collected in about two weeks and it was delivered within, in its entirety within about four weeks. And fortunately for us, both pipeline operators in this corridor, um, Enbridge and Trans Mountain, had, had actually collected LIDAR earlier in the year. And so we had that data ready to go to run the change detection comparisons with the new data. 
And so we were able to start delivering that uh, really quickly. And I'll just walk through a little bit about what, what LiDAR change detection is and, and how we're able to use it. So at, at a very high level, uh, LiDAR change detection is simply the, the difference between two bare earth LiDAR data sets at different points in time. And if you can imagine a landslide, um, very simple landslide where you might have negative change at the, at the head scarp um, and positive change at the toe. Basically with the LiDAR data, we use the point clouds to conduct a true three-dimensional change detection. So it's not a difference of DEMs. We're actually looking at the surface normal base change between uh, two data sets. And so when, when we get to the, the images in a second, the blue will always represent loss and the red will always represent gain of material. And so this is just an example of, of what it looks like uh, in reality. Uh, so the, the, the image on the right is a section of the, the Coquihalla Highway that was taken out the bridge that's on the ground that was fallen on the ground and the, the blue in, in all these instances is bank erosion um, where the river just cut directly into the bank or in this case the highway and there's a landslide at the north end of, of the top of this figure and that star just shows where this is so this is just an example of, of what the data looks like So doing LiDAR change detection is something that, that BGC does a lot of. Um, and over the past couple of years, we've seen a switch in, in how our clients are using LiDAR change detection from something that is, was traditionally done at a single site, a single high priority site where you might have multiple uh, runs of LiDAR data that you compare it to help understand or track the movement. But what we've seen in the last uh, 18 months or so is a lot of clients switching to using LiDAR change detection as a screening level tool and collecting entire corridors of data. And so thousands or, or in, in some instances, tens of thousands of kilometers of LiDAR data uh, collected over entire highway or pipeline corridors. And so there are a couple of clients that we've been working with to take this data and conduct um, so regional scale LIDAR change detection analyses on and then deliver the results digitally. And so the, this, this slide is actually unfortunately out of date, but it's out of date and a good reason in that um, BGC invested a lot of time into taking a process that was, it was fairly computationally intensive and hard for computers to do and rewrite the code so that it can run on a GPU at approximately um, somewhere between about 100 to 1,000 times faster than on a CPU. So that allows us to do hundreds or thousands of kilometers of LiDAR change detection in, in days instead of months and months. Um, and so we actually have filed for a patent on that application, which has been granted in the US. So we're, uh, it's no longer a patent pending. It's a, it's a patented process that allows us to slice and dice LiDAR data run change detection on it and then recompile the results and deliver them digitally. Uh, so with in, in this emergency response situation, uh, we are able to conduct LiDAR change detection and turn it around within day, within a day of delivering, of having the, the data delivered to us. Uh, and this is something that just wasn't possible um, six months or even a year ago. So pretty exciting um, to see it in real life. So when we look at the LiDAR data, um, this is just one subset, one sort of small region. There's a, a the Coquihalla is at the, the top left that Carrie Ann can curse over it. Um, and then there's roads down at the bottom, sort of uh, local roads. And then there's pipeline corridors that run right there. And then it takes a, a turn and goes up there, exactly. And so this is what the data looked like on July 15th, 2021. So as I said, this, this client had collected data in the summer. And if we just go to the next image, this is the what it looked like at November 22nd. So if Carrie Ann goes back one and then forward again, um, it doesn't take someone of Carrie Ann's uh, experience in terrain analysis to see the, the bank erosion and the landslide activity here. It's incredibly obvious, just the change in the morphology of this river. Um, and then what we do is we compare those two data sets, uh, the 3D point clouds of those data sets, and then here are the colors. 
And so you can kind of see the red is almost where that the river used to run. And it's showing positive change because it's now material there that's been placed there. And the blue is showing all of the erosion. And you can see uh, the whole river, every outside bend of that river is showing very significant amounts of erosion. So if you want to go to the next one, Carrie Ann. So when, when we deliver this type of data, um, it, it's processed and then and put out in Cambio, which is a platform that BGC uses uh, both internally and with our clients. And so as soon as this data is processed, it was in the hands of all of the engineers and geoscientists and our clients working on these projects. And so they're able to access that data digitally instead of um, with drawings or figures. And, and there's tools that allow anyone to go and, and cut profiles wherever they want through the, the data sets. And so there's a little, little profile drawn there and then the cross section or the profile through it at the bottom. And you can plot the different dates of the LIDAR data. And so what you see there is about 55 meters of lateral bank erosion at that site. And so a, a pipeline right away that used to be 50 or 60 meters from the edge of the river was now um, in the edge of an exposed bank. And so with this, these tools just allowed um, sort of widespread use of this data um, in a really easy format um, without any sort of specialized uh, programs that are normally required to, to manipulate or process LIDAR data. So it really brought down the, the usability to, to allow anyone uh, on our team to, to use it. Which was really really fun for me to see because I've been processing this kind of data for for nearly twenty years, and to to be at a place where we can process it process it and just get it out. Uh, I, I answer a lot of questions instead of doing a lot of work these days. Is kind of how things have changed, but uh, really fun to see tools like this just get in the hands of engineers, um, especially in an emergency response situation where where pretty big decisions are being made all the time and. Uh, yeah, just a, a fun change that I've seen in the in the community and, and what we've been able to do. So if you want to go to the next one, Carrie Ann, yeah, just the, the last thing here is the using LIDAR change detection for engineering. Um, again, it's it's a tool that that we've been using at BGC for a long time. Um, always always doing a three-dimensional change detection on it, which is a little bit more advanced um, computationally but gives really great results. And just using that um, to understand bank erosion, landslides, debris slides, evulsions. Like what we were able to do is, is virtually fly this entire corridor and pick off every location where, where a pipeline was exposed to a geohazard um, and, and sort of help rank those for um, in combination with field observations and past information about that site and just assist our field crews with the recovery, giving them the, the data that they need to help make their decisions um, and update their designs. Um, so that's, I think I'll pass it back to Carrie Ann now who will we'll close it out. Yeah, so we just want to summarize here. So this event was really a significant atmospheric river and it, it caused extensive flood and debris flow damage in BC. And it's really the combination of sort of a long duration event, but with high rainfall intensities that really led to that dynamic, both small streams experiencing debris flows and then much larger rivers experiencing floods. And on our uh, larger river systems, the main hazard that we saw was this significant bank erosion. And for those of you um, within you know, Alberta here, you, you know that that is a thing that can occur on mountainous rivers. But really for us here, this was the first time that we'd seen such a significant amount of erosion occur in such a widespread area and affect so much infrastructure. And for some of the some of the smaller mountainous streams, what we saw was this really heavy post wildfire effect, and that really increased some of the sediment transport into these major rivers. And so when we had small debris flows occurring, then all of that sediment went into those rivers and amplified the effects of that bank erosion. Um, our infrastructure was truly incapacitated by the floods, and it led to a situation that was quite tricky because if you wanted to repair the road, you had to have diesel to fill up that uh, excavator. But in order to fill up that excavator with diesel, we needed to have the pipeline back in operation, which you needed a road to get to. And so it's this interplay between all of our infrastructure 
in such a tight mountainous corridor. And what was truly humbling to see was just the massive amount of, of human implication for this flood. Uh, we had thousands of people evacuated, which came after a summer of large wildfires. And so people were already in hotels because of the wildfires. And then we had to evacuate more people on roads that were closed into places that were safe. And on top of that, we also had homes and livelihoods affected by this disaster. And as Matt pointed out, it's, it, this is likely going to be the most expensive natural disaster in, in, in our history in Canada. Um, the insurable losses are only about half a, million, half a billion dollars, um, but the current estimate is with insurable losses, non-insurable losses, as well as recovery efforts, we're currently looking at about a seven and a half to eight billion dollar recovery effort just to get us to back where we were. And I'm not talking about what recovery looks like and future. I'm just talking about getting us back to the state that we were on November 13th. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Matt and Carrie Ann. That was very informative and, and visual as well. Um, yeah. So